Our next speaker loves maps, leaves, and surveys. She is a master's student in the School of Information. Please welcome Jackie Bowen. We shove a lot of metaphorical needles into a lot of metaphorical haystacks. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, I mean that as humans, we're creating data all the time and putting it in places where sometimes we don't even know where it is, but it's constant data. And that makes sense because as humans, even though this is kind of a sweeping generalization, we love data. We talk about it all the time. Um, a lot of people these days like to talk about big data, but in general, we love data as a species. And that makes sense because we have a lot of data. DNA contains more information than most of us can even conceive of, and at a size that most of us can't conceive of either. Um, it's what creates most of the variety in this auditorium and around the planet. That's a lot of data. You heard that phrase, big data. So what is big data? Well, I define it in a couple different ways. Um, firstly, it has to have volume. It has to be of a size such that analyzing that data is difficult because of its size. You need special methodology or computing power. It has to have velocity. So it has to change and grow. So the things that people post on Facebook in a given week, that's always changing. There's always more, um, and that makes it difficult to analyze. And it has to have variety. So um, if you have a ton of exactly the same data, that's not really super interesting, but if you have a lot of really different data that varies a lot and changes a lot, that's a big challenge. So yeah, there's a lot of variety on this planet, and there's a lot of data that's being created all the time and stored in all these places, but what I'd really like to argue is that even though you hear the phrase big data all the time, what's really interesting, or you may hear the phrase big data all the time, what's really interesting is the small pieces of data, the details that you can dig into and look at the context and the why. There are lots of kinds of small data. What is small data? Well, I also define that in a bunch of different ways. Um, but really, I'd like to suggest that small data is an amount of data that a person or a few people can conceptualize on their own and analyze on their own with their own computing power without a ton of money or a ton of servers or anything like that. It doesn't necessarily have to fit on a disk, but it can be anything that someone can really dig into and look at the reasons it exists and how it got to be wherever it's stored. <coughs> There are a lot of interesting different small data stories and we're all creating them all the time and we can ask different kinds of questions about small data. Uh, one really good example I like is say there's a population of 10 people um, and they speak a language that nobody else speaks any longer and two of them use words for things that the other eight don't use. Well, there are, that's a very small amount of data that one person can think about and conceptualize, but asking the right questions about that data and asking what languages those people speak and what people those people came into contact with can get you really interesting answers and lead you to interesting questions about those people and those populations and that language's history. And that's the sort of thing that's really, really valuable. So people in companies and nonprofits lately, at least in my life, like to talk about making data-driven decisions. And I think that's great. It's really important to look at data and to use the scientific method and so on. But I'd like to suggest that data-driven decisions are really a lot more like that. Um, so <laughs> context, what is this, right? It's uh, goats and trees. Is it Photoshop? Is it from a movie? Well, if you, you can only see the sky in this picture, not the ground. But if you could see the ground, you'd know it was full of desert and that you'd know these are mountain goats and you'd know then that they have become adept at climbing into these trees to get at argon berries which sustain them and knowing this about their environment and what they do to get food allows you to ask more interesting questions about that environment and that population and that's small data and even if it's not a small amount of data you have to remember that the context is always going to be really important so if you have these big aggregates these forests of information in Facebook, for example, and um, other such things. If you dive into the individual trees, the small amounts of data that you can think about the context for and ask why, that's where you'll find the really interesting research questions. Um, so as we talked about DNA earlier and how um, everyone has it, so that's a lot of data, right? But DNA is four amino acids, if you're being really basic about it. When you look at complicated genetic problems, a lot of those are looking at small combinations of those four amino acids, how they're different from one another. So every person um, interacting with germs in different ways and diseases and getting bikes from bike chairs and going to common cycle and walking through cities in different ways is 
made up of lots of different pieces of small data. So when you want to look at a data-driven decision and ask a really interesting research question, I would suggest that you look really closely at the small things and the context and ask why. Thank you.